Hello, people. Just laying in bed Friday. Fucking hard uh, day's work today. Spent six hours outside today in a fucking blizzard and windy, and it was the same bullshit yesterday. I finished a book. <laughs> Salambo. Salambo. It's kind of a nice book. Uh, it's got like this little box that it fits in. I was kind of surprised that... Actually, I, I don't know why I bought this fucking thing. Usually I don't spend... It was 20 bucks for this book. Usually I don't spend quite that much. But I was there at the used bookstore. And uh, I, I I figured I wouldn't be back for a little while. So I got three books and I've read all three of them. This book was written by Gustav Flaubert. And uh, my wife had bought a, a like like the works of Gustav Flaubert, and uh, I I said to her I said you know I've I've heard that fucking name before, I just can't place it. I'd never read anything written by him before. Normally I don't read novels at all, but I I sort of enjoyed this. Every once in a while I'll read a novel, and. Uh, well, I had Googled Flaubert to, to, to find out when, you know, why I knew, why his name sounded familiar to me. And when I did, it kind of all clicked because Flaubert was in Paris while the, god damn, while the, uh, while the siege was going on in 1870. I don't know if he was in Paris or if he was in a uh, suburb of Paris. I don't know. But uh, he was close enough to where, you know, uh, Prussian troops were billeted in his house. And, and uh, of course, he fucking cried a river about that. But let's get to the, the little notes I got in here the sticky notes that I got aren't worth a fuck. They kept falling out, and I like to have them on the page where I, you know, where I figured I would want to read from. But they kept falling out. I know. Wah. This is still in the foreword, and uh, there was people alive that Flaubert could talk to regarding the raft of the Medusa. He interviewed these people so that he would know what, you know, what a horrible, what it was like to live through an atrocity. And uh, I just thought it was kind of cool that, uh, that the Medusa was even mentioned in here. I do have a book about the Medusa, and I'm always, I always have my eyes open for another one. It's a horrible shipwreck cannibalism story, the Medusa. And uh, this book was written in 1862, 316 pages, and this, it's kind of like a love story, only the love story takes, takes a back seat to the Mercenary War. The Mercenary War followed closely on the heels of uh, the First Punic War uh, when Carthage's uh, mercenaries came back after they surrendered to Rome. Uh, Carthage didn't pay them, so, so they rebelled and they laid siege to Carthage and they, you know, wasted uh, Carthage's land and... and uh, the war kind of goes back and forth, and then Hamilcar takes over, and Hamilcar, he's kind of a, a, a brilliant uh, fellow there. There was many Hamilcars throughout the years in Carthage. Uh, Hamilcar, Hanno, Hasdrubal, and Hannibal, those are the names that pop up over and over and over. 
So, so yeah, he, he, there's not a whole lot in print about the Mercenary War. I haven't read a whole lot about it. Just brief recaps. But apparently, Polly Bias writes about the Mercenary War. And so, I'm going to have to get this Polly Bias. I, I think it's, I think the books are called The Histories. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I just made a note here about the illustrations in this book. I don't know if these illustrations are, are an original, or if somebody newer has done updated illustrations, but they're, they're drawings, and, and they're, they're childlike. Uh, I could draw that well. So I have no idea if those illustrations were in the book in 1862, this copy was printed in 1960. And here on this page, uh, the uh, mercenaries have not rebelled yet. This is page 60. And they're just negotiating with the Carthaginians to try and get their money. And the man that's, that's uh, the agent for the Carthaginians, his name is Gisgo. G-I-S-G-O. And I have no idea whether that's, you know, historically accurate or what. But Hannibal, the Hannibal that crossed the Alps with his elephants and, and uh, wreaked havoc in Italy for 15 years, uh, Hannibal won a battle called Cannae. And it was just, it was a frickin' massacre. They, they massacred the Romans. Cana gets studied, to this day, Cana gets studied. In, you know, in, in uh, officer training schools and shit like that. But what made me, you know, write why Gisco, that's what I wrote, is because Hannibal, there's not too many quotes attributed to Hannibal. Uh... And Hannibal was the Second Punic War. But apparently right before Cana, Hannibal has a scout. And that scout's name is Gisco. And Gisco comes to Hannibal because he's concerned they can see the Roman army. And they can see that the Roman army outnumbers them probably two to one. And uh, Gisco raises these concerns with Hannibal. And Hannibal says to him, and this is, you know, you have no idea whether this really happened or not, but I've read this quote several times. Hannibal says to him, he says, you know what's really amazing about this multitude of Romans is that not one of them is named Gisco. And the meaning of this has been debated. There's, there's fucking pages on Wikipedia about what did Hannibal mean? Uh, of course Hannibal meant that none of them were like Gisco. None of them were as reliable. Okay, I've got a note here. The elephants, uh, war elephants, appear an awful lot in this book. And my first note here just says, war elephants were seldom successful. They, they really, you know... Things could happen, and the elephants would turn back and run back on their own men. And, and uh, a couple times in this book, though, the elephants, uh, Hanno, he knew how to uh, use the elephants too. Hanno was not very successful, but he saved his ass a couple times with uh, some lines of elephants. Uh, ha Hamilcar really knew how to use the elephants, so they 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 used them with a lot of su success in this war. Uh, the mercenaries split their army into three camps, which was not smart. Hanno, you know, he actually uh, he actually defeats a portion with elephants. Hanno, at the end, gets fucking crucified. Okay, I got to go a long ways here without any notes. There's no, there wasn't much sense putting notes in here because this is not. It's not what I typically read. I'm not going to put notes about a romance. But 
the war is going badly for the Carthaginians, and they decide that what they're really what they're doing wrong is they haven't appeased their god uh, Moloch, and uh, Melquart was the other god, but they spell it differently in here, and so the Carthaginians decide to sacrifice a bunch of their children by throwing them into a fire. And I just thought it was interesting the Carthaginians get this, they get, you know, people say, oh yeah, they, these fuckers uh, sacrifice their own children. I've read other authors that say that this is just Roman propaganda. And they actually found cemeteries out the, outside of Carthage where the amount of bones from children are no different than cemeteries at other places. So it might have just been Roman propaganda. There's Roman propaganda that's still around. And uh, the Roman propaganda that's still around, if you watch the movie Cleopatra... Uh, where Cleopatra's boats abandon Mark Antony at the Battle of Actium. And Mark Antony is like, Where are you going? Why have you betrayed me? There was no betrayal there. That was all part of the plan. Mark Antony was not an idiot. He knew they were going to lose that battle. Cleopatra knew they were going to lose that battle. They wanted the Egyptian fleet to survive intact an example of Roman propaganda that's still around. There was other propaganda about the Carthaginians, too. Okay, and, and at the, this is my last note. I had, uh, oh, I put down here character development. There, there wasn't, I, I don't know. There wasn't a whole hell of a lot of character development. So I was just going to read a little bit so that you get an idea of how this Gustave Flaubert, how somebody might write. Oh, and I didn't mention uh, Flaubert, he wrote Madame Bovary. Everybody's heard of Madame Bovary. I've heard of it. I've never read it. But that's his big claim to fame. Second paragraph. And I have a good example of, of his descriptive writing style written down here. The festival was to last all night, and candelabra with many branches were planted like trees on the painted wooden woolen tapestries that covered the low tables. Large flagons of electrum amphoras of blue glass. Electrum is uh, uh, silver mixed with gold. Tortoiseshell spoons and small round loaves were crowded between the double row of pearl-bordered plates. Clusters of grapes with their leaves, like tharsi, entwined vine stocks. Blocks of snow were melting on ebony salvers. Lemons, pomegranates, gourds, and watermelons were piled in hillocks beneath the tall, massive silver ornaments. Wild boars with open jaws wallowed in the dust of spices. Hares cooked whole, still in their skins, seemed to leap among the flowers. Shells were filled with mixed meats. Pastries were in symbolic forms. And when the dish covers were removed, doves flew forth. And then I've also got bottom of 313. Uh, and this is, uh, one of the guys' name is Mathos, and, and uh, you know, they make a spectacle out of, out of executing Mathos. The war is over here, and, and he's one of their prisoners. A child tore his ear, a young girl concealing under her sleeve a spindle, with the point of it slit his cheek. They pulled out handfuls of his hair, tore strips from his flesh, and others held sticks on which were fastened sponges saturated in filth, with which they buffeted his face. I'm assuming that the filth they're talking about is, is human feces. A stream of blood gushed from the right side of his throat, and immediately the throng went wild. This last barbarian represented to them all the barbarians, all the army. On him they revenged themselves for all their disasters, fear and shame. The rage of the people increased with its gratification. The chains strained too tight as they leaned against them, 
threatening to part asunder. They were insensible to the blows of the slaves dealt to force them back. Some clung to the projections of the houses. All the openings in the walls were choked by heads, and the evil they were incapable of doing to his person, they howled upon him. Their maledictions teemed with atrocities of obscene abuse, with ironical encouragements and imprecations, and as they, as they were dis, dissatisfied with his present agonies, they prophesied others more terrible for eternity. And I think that's about it. He doesn't pull any punches writing about uh, horrible things. There's lots of horrible little chapters in this. Thank you.